we're going to just talk in magnitude, VO2 max and muscular strength stand in a league of their own. Hmm. So there's really nothing that's within the zip code of those two metrics. So having very, very high VO2 max for your age and sex and being very strong. I mean, again, they have more of a positive impact than any single thing we can think of has a negative impact. And that includes having end-stage renal disease, like being on the wait list for a kidney while you get dialysis, being a smoker, having high blood pressure, having type 2 diabetes, being obese. The downside of those things is relatively small compared to the upside of having a high VO2 max and being very strong. So we almost shouldn't even talk about things until people are willing to accept that fact and take the steps necessary to address them. Now, you might say, well, okay, how many people can become very, very strong or have a very high VO2 max? And the answer is I don't know. Like I don't know, especially on the VO2 max side, you know, to get into that top 2.5% of the population where you really start to see an enormous gap between you and everybody else in terms of lifespan. Yeah, maybe, maybe only a quarter of the population has the potential to get there. But the point is, everybody has the potential to be more fit than they are, you know, outside of people who are already doing everything they can. And so just going from being in the bottom 25% of the population to the 25th to 50th percentile of the population cuts your risk of all-cause mortality in half at any point in time. Hmm. There's nothing that compares to that. Like, there's no drug out there that's going to do that. So again, I think you could talk about drugs all day long and how I think they're really important and how we could think about controlling ApoB and, you know, rapamycin and metformin and all these other things. All that stuff is, you know, it's, it's pixie dust compared to what these things are. <laughs> On the strength side, the same thing. Anyone who's got older parents knows this. If you really want to watch somebody suffer when they're aging, you watch them losing their cognition and you watch them losing their physical body. You watch them lose the ability to move around with ease, to, to have balance, to be pain-free, all of these things. Well, a big part of that is being strong. You know, strength is something we can actually hang on to as we age. You know, we lose quickness long before we lose strength. And, you know, that's, that's the good news. The bad news is it, you have to be very deliberate in how you train it, right? So I'm sure on the podcast, you've discussed type one and type two muscle fibers. So people are probably familiar with that. Why don't you reiterate that? So we basically have, you know, our muscles are made up of these fibers. They're very unique properties. So muscles are these multicellular things where the, the cells are these long sort of fibers that contract past each other. And that's what can, creates the, the contraction of a muscle. But if you dig a little bit deeper, you have different types of fibers. So you have type 1 fibers, which are fueled mostly, if not entirely, by an aerobic process. So they can use fat, they can use glucose, but they do so in the presence of oxygen primarily. They're very slow to fatigue, which is mostly where the name comes from. But they don't generate that much force. So these are the muscle fibers that are mostly on display when you're, you know, walking or just carrying out activities of daily living. Right. Commonly called slow twitch, as you alluded to, slow twitch muscle Correct. fibers. Yeah. So you can do things for a long period of time and these things don't fatigue. Conversely, another subset of these fibers are type two fibers and they're called fast twitch muscle fibers and they're fast to fatigue. Now they're much more powerful. So when a type two fiber contracts, far more is happening. You know, it's generating far more force, but it's doing so with a different metabolic strategy. So it's glycolytic. It's just using glucose or, you know, broken down glycogen and it's going to fatigue quickly. So it's accumulating metabolic byproducts that are leading to fatigue. So there's a reason why if I say, Tim, jump up and down as high as you can, as many times as you can, this is not going to be a long exercise, right? We don't have to sit and wait <laughs> two hours for you to finish that. You're going to fatigue pretty quickly if you're doing maximal jumps. Whereas if I say jump rope, you could do that for 30 minutes easily. And if you're you know, a relatively fit person. So you get the sense of the difference. Now, as we age, we lose power and explosiveness 
more than anything else, and we lose that the soonest, and that's due to the type 2 fiber, the atrophy of the type 2 fiber. And this, again, this comes back down to strategy. So that's why if you want to live a longer, better life, you have to have a strategy in place for maintaining type 2 fibers. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get that without resistance. Yeah. You won't, you know, you can't say, look, I, I play tennis every day. I walk every day. Those things are great. They're not doing something for your type two fibers. 